on today's episode of the unwritten rule just got a two-man show for you guys to start your week uh peyton is out but it'll be kenny and i we have uh just one piece of news we got some scheduling news from mizzou football for future scheduling in 2025 a road game an unfortunate road game that it looks like mizzou is going to avoid so uh me and kenny talked about that and then we talked uh, about an article from uh, our good friend of the program gerard hamilton from power mizzou uh everyone should go read it it is on mizzou's x factors he named five of them uh, in his article and kenny and i kind of just further break them down give our own takes uh and thoughts on those so uh yeah just some a uh, little pre kind of a good uh, pre-fall camp episode, you know, as we get closer and closer. We already have media stuff coming in uh, from fall camp from from Sunday afternoon that we'll get to on Friday show when we have Peyton on. So uh, there will be plenty to talk about here in the next few weeks, I promise. But until then, uh, should have a good should have a good show with Kenny and I. Then we did uh, quick hits, got a Ken Sports Shorts, talked a little Olympics, uh, had Tigers in the wild, talked some Michael Sam, some Harrison Mevis, some Christian Schweitzer, more Olympics talk there. Uh, and then headlines, talk some baseball, uh, another layered V chire uh, in the administration, talk a little bit about that, and then finish with some uh, some Marvel movie talk. So we, we, we went a little off sports for the last headline uh, this week in Quick Hits. So good show uh, to start your week. We'll get into it without further ado. The Unwritten Rule starts right now. I just, I... Marcel, where are you going with that disc? <laughs> you are not putting that on again. Marcel, okay, if you press that button, you are in very, very big trouble. Attention, everybody stop what you're doing. It's time for The Unwritten Rule, a Mizzou sports podcast brought to you by the Believe Network, alongside Peyton Haverman and Kenny Van Doren. Here is your host, Jack Knowlton. Welcome back to the Unwritten Rule. Today is Monday, July 29th, and it is back to a two-man show with myself and Kenny Van Doren. Peyton Haverman is absent. Uh, he is he is out. We don't have another big interview uh, that we can kind of rub in his face for missing, but uh, you know he is he is gone nonetheless, which means he's going to miss out. We're going to do our uh, X factors for the 2024 season for Mizzou football, Kenny, uh, in a second. But so Peyton will, Peyton will miss out on that, but he will be back. We have big Mount Rushmore we want to do uh, too with with some with that involves Mizzou. So we're going to get to that hopefully on Friday. Uh, it should be a fun one. Anyway, quit teasing future episodes. We're here in the moment right now, Kenny, uh, and we have some scheduling news to talk about with a future Mizzou non-con game. Before we do that, I want to ask you. Mizzou's non-con games, they've gotten a lot of, you know, attention, you know, and scrutiny, I'll say, from Mizzou fans with the the Jim Sterk era, uh, which now we're two ADs beyond Jim Sterk, which is kind of wild. But, uh, you know, his his kind of fingerprints have still been all over Mizzou's scheduling with non-con games, particularly, you know, you've got UMass this season. There's some interesting, there's been some interesting games in years past, obviously Boston College. You're playing like Buffalo. Now, you know, you're kind of graduating into a better era of non-con games from Mizzou. How excited are you to to see, you know, like a can even a Kansas and an Illinois, there's some rivalry games, maybe even, you know, a bigger power four non-con team playing Mizzou, uh, you know, in an era now where hopefully Mizzou has graduated to, to being better than certainly our time at, at school. But uh, how do you feel about the non-con getting at least better than going to UMass, which... Oh, I'm going to start with you, Mass, because I think it's not getting enough buzz outside of the Mizzou world, outside of the state of Missouri that it should. And yeah. I think once that game happens this season, I think you're going to see a lot of posts online of Mizzou running out and you know onto the field. And people are just like, what is going on? It'd be a lot of non-context football uh, posts, I think. I think that would be just you know one of the big ones, and it's probably going to go a little bit viral just seeing that. Uh, but, you know, talking about Jim Sterks, you know, um fingerprints are still on this like you said it's two years removed that's exactly that's my first thought that i had is that it's two years removed and those schedules are you know still happening kind of just shows you how much you know goes into being an athletic director you know how much you have to build a ahead of time over the years and you've had two people in charge since you were in charge and that's yeah. just kind of crazy where it goes but in that 2025 season you still have kansas louisiana umass uh just one less opponent and i, I think it's going to be kind of a funny one that they're not going to be playing this team yeah, so that that gets into the news. It's like, why are we talking about scheduling? For those who didn't see, 
one game that was going to maybe happen in 2025 that looks like now it's not uh, is Miami of Ohio. Uh, Mizzou is going to play, uh, I believe, at home on September uh, 13th was when it was supposed to be. Or no, at Miami of Ohio, excuse me. So it's going to be another absolutely just asinine road trip for Mizzou. Um, you already have the likely probability that a ranked Mizzou team is going to go to UMass. Now, thankfully, it looks like Mizzou is not going to play at Miami of Ohio because uh, Miami of Ohio released their 2025 non-conference schedule and they have four games, did not include Mizzou. Um, they, don't, they don't have a game on the date of September 13th set uh, from, the, from the post that we saw, but you would think they already have those four non, they have four non-con games themselves scheduled. There's probably a buy in there. Um, <laughs> thank goodness Mizzou is not going to have to go to Miami, Ohio. No disrespect to the Mac. I know, you know, Kenny, you and I, we're, we're football fans. We love Mac action, you know, Tuesday night. Do you think that game would have been on a Tuesday, like a Tuesday or a Wednesday in just the middle of September? That would have been a just a putrid game for Mizzou to keep, but it looks like they're not now. Yeah, let's let's go to 2025 and see what actual day that was on the calendar. Pulling it up September 13th. Okay, it would have been a Saturday. Okay, um, not a big right. deal, but... I think only the Mac games are the Mac teams against the Mac teams that are in, in the conference. middle of the week. But the one thing that just made it so funny to me, if this game act- actually had happened, and I don't think he would have any more eligibility, but Brett Gabbert, um, the brother of Blaine Gabbert, former Mizzou quarterback, is in his sixth season at Miami. And, you know, there's 2025, you know, another year under his belt. I thought it would have been hilarious if he got his seventh year and got to face <laughs> Mizzou at home of all places. Yeah. Yeah. That would have been welcome, welcoming his, you know, yeah. That would have been a very personal game for him. Um, I didn't realize he's been in, in college for six years already. So what was he class of, was he class of 2019 in high school? Must have been. Uh, doesn't even say it on his profile, but I guess that's exactly what it would have been. And he was their starter last year, right? Yes. He also entered the transfer portal and then came back <laughs> uh, in his tenure with bull with, uh, Miami, Miami of Ohio. sixth year Jeez. Christian brothers shout out St. Louis. Yeah. CBC. Uh, so I guess that hypothetical great matchup wouldn't is, is maybe not happen. Probably not happening now. Um, but that was, that was some kind of, you know, a little bit of scheduling news there. And it just is a reminder of hopefully that the era that we're leaving. Uh, and Kenny, I want to ask you this before we move on uh, in the spirit of hopefully Mizzou having more fun non-conference matchups. And this is kind of like a, I think a wider conversation because there's the whole, you know, expanded playoff. The thought of conferences have gotten obviously bigger and better sec with, with uh, the SEC adding Oklahoma and Texas, you have teams who have kind of considered, I saw this with, with USC in the big 10 and their rivalry with Notre Dame. Obviously that's a non-conference game for them. You know, Lincoln Riley was kind of talking about, Oh, maybe we'll eliminate that game because we want to have an easier game on our schedule. Cause we have harder conference games every year with, with that in mind, you know, it, it seems interesting kind of what the future will be of kind of marquee non-conference, you know, big games. Who would you want to see if, say, it was a, a ranked matchup? We won't say like one and two, a power four team, let's say coming to Columbia or it's a home and home. You have to have that team come to Columbia. You have to go to that team, a power four big matchup for Mizzou to have. Hmm. And don't say so I think the. Yeah, the easiest ones are like Kansas, Kansas State. Of course, Kansas State has been ranked in recent years, especially in those comp- in those games against Mizzou. I, you know, I love the regional um, battles. I think when I was on the football beat, I wrote a couple articles just about you know how important those regional games were. Talking mainly about Kansas State, and then Drink was really gotten into it as well. Um, but I think you know, I don't think Illinois will ever be ranked um, to that extent when yeah. Mizzou is ranked. But I think Illinois Mizzou would be really cool to bring back and. I mean, I was never lived during, I mean, never was a fan during that era when those two teams probably faced each other, um, more so just in basketball, but to see it in football would be really cool. Uh, I think just facing a, a border border team that's not in your conference that you haven't faced in a long time is uh, what I would like to see on the schedule. I think that one might be happening. It is happening. It is coming up. Yeah. Yeah. 2026 and 2027. Uh, 2026, they're at Illinois. 2027, uh, it's home at Faro. Yeah, I like obviously, like you said, the kind of old Big 12, Big 8 uh, kind of era games would be fun. I think Mizzou, Colorado would be really fun just because there is history there. And also, you know, of course, you have Colorado, the 
you know, most interesting experiment right now in college football. Um, but those aside, I think the obvious ones aside, like Colorado, Iowa State, I think would be another fun one if you could renew that. If I'm going, I'll go a little bit of left field too. I kind of want to see Michigan Mizzou for some reason. You know, they beat they beat Ohio State, take down the other, you know, dominant team of the recent era in the Big Ten, play Michigan to be the Jeremiah Beasley Bowl too at linebacker transferred over maybe a Michigan or like a Penn state Penn state could be kind of fun. Yeah. I think more fun for Mizzou than Penn state. Uh, I don't, I just don't know. I think you want a team that comes in and also treats it as a big game at the same time. And I think for the Michigan one, I, I, first thing I went through my mind is that you have to wear the block M because there's always that discourse on who had the block yep. M first. And I don't think Michigan fans probably care as much about than Mizzou fans because Mizzou fans probably get the, the more of the jokes that they stole it. And in reality, Mizzou did not steal the block M, but I, I like that. I think it's, but I just, I think you really want a team that also treats it like a big game. And I mean, it's kind of a tough one to try to figure out who, who would treat Mizzou like a big game, but Mizzou's coming. I mean, another good season here. Um, some teams will start to do that. Yeah. They're on the come up. I think, I don't know. I think it'd be interesting. Maybe like an Arizona Mizzou, Arizona state Mizzou. Just trying to think of something a little bit more left field than like, like you said, the Kansas States or the Oklahoma States or Iowa State or yeah. KU. Be interesting. I mean, then and that's the air win. We've got, you know, we've got some exciting Mizzou games uh coming up. They're gonna play Florida Atlantic, Kenny. No lane there anymore, but you got that. You got that to look forward to. I'll be there. They'll be I at probably Florida. Won't be, but I wish they'll I be there. at Florida Atlantic in twenty thirty one. Did you go to that game? Poker oh yeah, time. I would definitely go to that. I have a <laughs> my aunt lives there. There you go. You got a place to stay. That's, that's half the battle. Uh, yeah, so there you go. There's some scheduling news. Hopefully Miami at Miami of Ohio is not happening anymore for uh, the Missouri Tigers. Um, other than that, we have no no big, you know, news topics, so to speak. Anything like, uh, you know, breaking or anything like that. Obviously, fall camp is coming up here in the in the coming week for Mizzou. So we'll have, you know, all that covered and stuff like that. Storylines should emerge and all that. But heading into fall camp, Kenny, I want to talk about this. Uh, we had an article come out on Power Mizzou from our good friend Gerard Hamilton. Shout out. He does a great job uh, covering the Mizzou beat. And everyone should go read this article um, because I'm not going to read the entire thing to you. But I thought we'd talk about this. Gerard did an article, five Missouri X Factor players for the 2024 season. Uh, and I thought it would be fun to look at who he submitted or he said could be an X factor for next year. And then you and I, Kenny have picked out one each apart, a separate from this list that, uh, that we thought we could talk about. So I'll run through, I'll, I'll do it like this, Kenny, I'll run through the five and then you talk about the, the names in the order that you want. Cause I think I know who you're going to speak about first. Uh, so Gerard had his five X factors, Marquise Johnson out at wide receiver, Brett Norfleet, of course, the tight end Marvin Burks uh, out in the secondary Jamari and Wayne, who is moving uh, back to cornerback heading into next season uh, and Williams one as his five. I have a feeling I know which one of those names you want to talk about. Talk about first, Kenny. Yeah. I think the first one that just jumps off the page is Jamarian Wayne. I mean, the, even the photo he, he's using for Jamarian Wayne uh, is from a scrimmage. It's from the spring game. So it just kind of shows you, I mean, you just still haven't seen a lot of Jamarian Wayne who, who moved to safety um, in that 2022 season. And then last year moved to wide receiver. It was a wide receiver in high school. Um, and now he's back to corner, back to defensive back. And we talked about it. It's a position group that still has a little bit of uncertainty. Of course, you do have Torian on pride coming over from um, Clemson and Missouri guy had some success there. Uh, so you're excited about him, but you also lose two corners to the NFL draft. So there, there's still a lot of question marks on how are you going to replace that? Cause it's, it's hard to say you're going to mirror the success that that room had the last couple seasons. Cause, and to be honest, it's, it's extremely hard to do. You know, I don't know if it's possible to do, you look at the depth right now, it's Dr- Drayden Norwood, uh, Toronto pride and Marcus Clark are those first three, but um, if you can get anything out of Jamari and Wayne, and I like what Gerard says here, uh, this may be a bit of wild card. Yeah, it is kind of a wild card, you know, it's, but if it, if it works out then that's pretty big because Jamari and Wayne was a big time recruit coming out of the St. Louis area. Um, and if you can kind of get just really any depth out of him this season in the cornerback room and just, um, cause I mean, he's kind of proven it that he's an athlete. He can play all on um, both sides of the field, but you just want to see that in game. Yeah. I, I like I I forgot all about Jamarian Wayne, quite frankly, because it has been such a weird 
kind of career path for him. But I think you're right. It's going to be, it's going to be interesting, you know, to see how he fits back in at cornerback in an area, like you say, Kenny of need. Um, Al Pogue had some, some good words for him in this article said he's, he's ideal prototypical from a size from, from a size wise, not a well constructed sentence there, Al. Uh, he's big, he's strong, he's physical, he's athletic. And more importantly, his competitive character is really high. Uh, talked about how he's a delight to be around. Um, and when it's his time, I'm going to drop the leash and say, uh, I told you guys he's excited to work with him. So yeah, I think it, it's so hard, you know, with, with players flip flopping back and forth. I mean, you have this, I feel like more and more now in college football where these guys are brought in as athletes. They could play in the secondary, they could play a wide receiver. And then you have cases where you find they find their fit right away. Or it's like Jamar and Wayne, where it takes a little bit to find really where his, where his comfort level is at either position that can be, you know, kind of a dangerous thing because he doesn't get settled. But um, yeah, I think, in a secondary that has a lot of mystery to it, shall we say? Maybe that's not the right word. I think he'll be, I think, I think he could, it's a good shout. Uncertainty. I yes. think that's the correct word. Yeah, that's a good word. Um, looking at some of other Gerard's other submissions. I don't, we don't need to talk. We've talked about Marquise Johnson ad nauseum. <laughs> I think, I think we can, we can let him go uh, unspoken about for a little while. Brett Norfleet. Uh, we are a Brett Norfleet podcast. Uh, I'm very excited. Kenny, I think actually I want your your thoughts on him briefly because I feel like you, especially you covered this team. We've all watched just how, frankly, how sorry the tight end position was for a long time, pretty much since like what Albert O was at Mizzou, and then to have Brett Norfleet, albeit I mean it's a great passing attack next year, probably with or without Brett Norfleet, but the fact that we can kind of forget that Mizzou has a good tight end feels kind of wild because of how bad their tight end room was for so long. I remember uh, when Eli Drinkwitz met students for the first time uh, after he was hired as the head coach for Mizzou. He, there was a student, it was like he was taking questions, and some of them were a little bit silly, you know, just mm -hmm. questions like that. Everyone wanted to start winning again, and someone asked, you know, how are you going to replace Albert O? And it's like, ah, oh, like that's such a, you know, like secondhand embarrassment, like hearing someone ask that because I mean, how is he supposed to answer that? It's not someone that he worked with, someone he coached, and it's just like, ah, oh, man. But I mean, it was a good question to ask because yeah. there just hasn't been that freshman, the guy that you can mold. And he, I just, re just realized that Gerard says mold in here about Brett Norfleet. And I talked about last year, he kind of looked like a gazelle out there. And there's still a lot for him to build into that frame and get used to his frame and um, really just be a little bit more athletic out there. And he's six foot seven, 235 pounds. Um, he's just a big guy. And I think that's just, it's just refreshing to have a guy that you can grow in your own system and not someone you just bring in from Buffalo or a uh, walk on you find on it stank and no, no shots at them. It's just, you just haven't had this in recent years. Yeah. And I think Gerard nailed it. You know, he talks about how Norfleet could maybe help Mizzou improve on its third rank red zone offense. That was such a refreshing thing where obviously you have Luther burden who can be a do it all guy in any down, any distance scenario. You had Cody Schrader who would punch it in Brady cook and use his legs. To have a guy in Norfleet who you could just loft, loft the ball up to or have him as a blocker in red zone situations, like look at the dividends that paid off for Mizzou last year and how it will probably get better. Like he said, he was a freshman. I mean, he's only he's only probably going to get better. He's six seven two thirty five. Like it's such a good frame for a tight end, especially a young tight end. Like it it's definitely it's an obvious uh, candidate. But I think with how good Brett Norfleet was last year, everyone you know kind of just cast him aside in an otherwise elite room. It's like, oh, yeah, Brett Norfleet will just do his thing again. This is just a Brett Norfleet appreciation post, I guess, <laughs> uh, you know, if you want to put it that way. But, yeah, I like Brett Norfleet. Um, what about Marvin Burks, Kenny? Uh, you know, going back to the secondary, I mean, a young player, again, who impacted last year. What do you think about uh, uh, him as an X factor for, for on Gerard's list? Yeah, he played in 13 games last season. He was a big part of that secondary, a big part of the depth, and um, lose another guy in Jalen Carley's to the NFL draft. So you, you want someone to step up, and uh, we've heard a lot about Marvin Burks the last couple of years, another St. Louis area kid, kind of deked Mizzou there a little bit in the recruiting, going to Ole Miss, and then visiting Mizzou a couple of times before flipping. Um, looks like he got what he wanted in, in this uh, in the switch, and 
I mean, it's kind of played out really well. Um, 16 tackles last season, um, a sack and a, and a fumble recovery. Um, I also like, you know, Philip Roche at that position as well. I think both of them are two young safeties that, um, you know, have the athleticism and have like the, the football IQ to play this position early on in their um, in their collegiate career. So uh, Marvin does have that edge on him with the playing time and just um, overall experience at the position. But uh, him and Philip are, are both two guys to keep your eyes on at the safety position this year. Yeah, I I feel like we say we we can just kind of say this about everybody in the secondary. It almost feels like they all could be X factors because it's just so much unknowns. I mean, Toriano Pride, I think it makes sense that he wasn't on this list at corner, but like feels like, like he would be an X factor. Mizzou does obviously was at Clemson. He should be good, but you know, we don't know how good he'll be at Mizzou. Like it's it's all kind of a mystery. It's almost like scary, but I guess it's it's probably good at least that Gerard included, you know maybe two names here that could that could be solid i know we're all big dalen carnell fans here and uh you know i think he i think he's gonna be vital at the at the star but yeah i i think i think it's good too that your highest ranked freshman in marvin burks had a good season i think that you know that means you're you're recruiting well it's paying off uh and all that speaking of high ranked freshmen the last one uh that gerard had on his list who i almost would argue you could feel is more of a wild card than than Wayne, maybe not. I, I'll get your thoughts, Kenny. The the williams Winery discourse has been interesting because I feel like I haven't seen with him what we saw with Luther Burden, where it was like the expectation was that he'd play right away and he'd play how he's played in his two years since in his freshman season. And obviously that didn't happen. And it often doesn't happen for freshmen. What are your expectations for, for williams Winery in his first season? Because I think it's it's really interesting. I think ultimately he's going to prove to be great and it's, it's great how committed he looks to the program and stuff like that. But um, wh what do you think about, about Williams in his, his first year and maybe being an X factor? That's who Gerard included at, at his fifth name. Yeah, this is, this is where you want those uh, cupcake games early on those um, <laughs> non-conference games. Cause you want Williams to get into those games, especially late and take a lot of snaps in the second half. If the game is out of reach for the opponent. And I think he'll still even play if they're, if they're not out of reach. He's on, he'll probably on be on the depth chart. Um, Johnny Walker, Zion Young, um, Eddie Kelly, Darius Smith, and Joe Mora, all, all guys who are rotating in at those positions. So I think it's obvious that you'll probably see Williams um, on that depth chart um, week one. And, you know, I, you know, I don't think you should expect so much from a guy, but he is a five star. Um, he's six foot six, two hundred sixty five pounds, so he does fit a good mold there at the position. Still a lot of room to grow, um, but you know, don't get like you know too upset if he's not putting you know filling up the stat sheet or you know not playing too much. But you still want to see him in those games. We've seen times before where Mizzou will land a big time recruit. Um, and he doesn't really play much in his freshman season, <laughs> but I think William Soneri is is different than that. I think he's a little bit um, advanced for his age, and he'll probably see a good amount of the field early on. Well, I think, I mean, I guess maybe not as a counter to that point, but to qualify that a little bit, like I mean. Gerard mentions that he thinks maybe Williams one area as well as Elias Williams and Jalen Brown, uh, not the Celtics small forward, uh, another recruit at, at defensive end. All three of those guys could maybe red shirt, uh, you know, this season. And I think it is easy when you're talking about like holding on to your expectations. It feels easier to do that with a defensive end versus a wide receiver. I feel like you just want mm -hmm. wide, like if we're comparing Williams and Luther Burton, like, you want the wide receivers to be making plays right away. You know, you saw what Marquise Johnson did as a true freshman and stuff like that. But I think, yeah, if we see Williams one area red shirt, that doesn't feel like it should be a panic button situation. Mm -hmm. If anything, you should, well, I guess you probably hope that he only spends three years at Mizzou if he lives up to his five stars. But if anything, it should, I feel like it should be a good thing. What do you think? Yeah. Uh, I think some Mizzou fans might want him to stay that extra year. I think a lot of people would, you know, maybe want Luther to stay another year, but I think we can all kind of assume he's not going to. I, I hope not. <laughs> season goes well. If he stays uh, another year, there's, I don't know. There might be some question marks about how this last year went. So, yeah, yeah. It, it's just, it just depends. We don't know where Williams and Neri will, will be in two years um, in his own game. But, yeah, I think there's still a lot, you know, a lot of room to grow, like I said. So, if he's um, not really, you know, I mean, I don't really know. I mean, if he's moving well, if he's playing well, maybe they just don't even care about burn, you know, worrying about a, a red shirt, but maybe getting him into three of those games early on and then seeing if you, if he develops in practice, plays well, then you think about using that fourth game and then from there. 
Yeah, yeah, I I would I would agree. I think if if he looks good in the four games he plays, that's a nice thing with football too. You still can't appear in those four games and make a little bit of an impact. Like he's gonna build on something. Williams one area will be fine. And I think Gerard and you you said all the names too, like Johnny Walker, Zion Young, Eddie Kelly, Darius Smith, Joe Moore. There's maybe shoot some X factors in there with like Eddie Kelly and Dar- like for it, to me it feels like. And we talked to Callum. I asked him about this. I remember Callum McAndrew from the Tribune. I asked him about Darius Smith. It does not feel like he's gotten nearly enough buzz. He feels like a fall camp guy that like he transferred from Georgia. Like he had a good year last year. Like it's and and you know he comes to a Mizzou defense that that kind of needs him. I mean that feels like X factor to me. If not by the time the season starts, he already graduates into kind of expecting him big things out of him. I don't know. I think Mizzou did, did really well in the transfer portal. And it's just like almost gotten forgotten just because it, it feels like an eternity ago. That's just how our minds work with time. But anyway, uh, on that tangent, my last quick note before we move on, can you do, do what are the rules with alcohol and NIL deals? Because Johnny Walker, that feels like it needs to be a, <laughs> <laughs> not with I'm williams one area that can't yeah happen. not with williams one area <laughs> i just saw johnny walker it just it pops in my head every time gotta get him that i don't know i think it's probably not the best pr move probably not. Um, for a college not. kid i don't know i don't i'm trying to think about some nfl players who might have you know maybe like bud light deals or something whatever the, the beer of the nfl is but i just don't even think it's the best <laughs> pr move but i i get it you know i get that there is a johnny walker um, brand out there I just don't think whoever is NIL agent, if he has one, uh, would sign off on it. And I don't necessarily think if Johnny Walker is really reaching out. But I, I like <laughs> the idea. I like the idea. I just don't know if it's the best PR move. I'm definitely not the first person to think of that. I won't be the last. I'll probably say it again if Johnny Walker has a has a you know three sack game, get him a deal. Uh, I don't know. And I, NIL is a is a crazy time. We could do a podcast in of itself on that. Anyway, on that goofy note. We will uh we'll finish the show. Peyton, you got any thoughts before we uh kick it to ourselves? Oh, just kidding. He's not here, is he? All right. <laughs> that was good, Kenny. Uh all right, we will finish the show. Uh round things out with quick hits. Okay, quick hits time. We have a Ken Sports Shorts. Kenny, please tell me Sporkle is not in the mix again. <laughs> uh Sporkle is not in the mix. You've been uh, talking up the uh, Olympic Games and the Olympics have started. Uh, You were also just talking about USA basketball before we jump back into quick hits. So I have a pretty easy one for you today. You probably will get one of them pretty quickly. Uh, But all time, there have been 20 appearances. This is the 21st appearance for a U.S. men's basketball team in the Olympics. But in those 20 appearances, three times they didn't win the gold medal that they want. They finished in the top three but did not receive the gold medal. Uh, once silver and twice for the bronze. Yeah. Can you tell me those seasons or those oh, years? Jeez. Well, I think one of them had to be before the dream team because I think the reason they made the dream team was because they lost, and the dream team was in the nineties. <laughs> okay, well, I, I gotta go backwards. So we had 2021, 2016, 2012, 2008, 2004, 2000. 92 was the dream team. Oh, okay. So 1988. Yes. What, what, uh, what medal? Bronze. So correct. Bronze. Okay. Two more. I think one of them was in the two thousands. I think you'd be correct. This is a pretty popular one. Yeah. Was it 2008? No. 12. No, 2012 was a big no, no, one. 2012 was, was the big, big one they won. You're right. You're right. 2004? Correct. 2004. 2004. Okay. Yeah, I was. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then. Last one's pretty tough. I yeah, don't even I've... think you'll be able to name a player on this team. 1976. I don't know. Very close. 1972. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't nice. know. Who been that was that a team. silver. Okay. Yeah, it was 04 because then eight. Yeah. I have a trivia question for you on the same vibe. Okay. Uh, who was the leading scorer for the U.S. in the 2021, 2016, and 2012 Olympics? It's one guy for all three. Okay. You said 2020... 2021 or 2020. Yeah. 2016 and 2012. 
It's not LeBron. I feel like that'd be too easy. Nope. Uh, Chris Paul. No, that's not a bad guess. Uh, do you want? Do you want the answer? Or do you want to try? I it? think Melo would have already been out, so he wouldn't have played in that last yeah, one. Yeah, he was not in twenty twenty one. I don't think. Is it a big man? No. I don't know then. Well, he is tall, but it's not a not a traditional big. It is a uh, Kevin Durant. Okay. Man, Kevin Durant Lennon. I I didn't know that. Good. And like I kind of felt like that should have been a fact I knew. And I like Kevin Durant, which is not a popular opinion anymore. But yeah, he's le- he led in 2012, 2016, 2021. And they just played. We're recording this on Sunday. They just played Serbia and he was great in that game too. He's like that's that should be a big part of his legacy in my opinion that he's like been that good in the Olympics. And they won gold in all those. Like I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm just being a, a Kevin Durant defender when the Olympic Reaper. Yeah, it yeah. could be his nickname now. Olympic Reaper. There you go. Uh, yeah, there's your there's your Olympics. We'll have I have a Tigers in the Wild that's Olympics too. But uh, before I do that to myself, I won't uh, skip you and Peyton. What is your Tiger in the Wild, Kenny? Uh, my Tiger in the Wild goes to Michael Sam. I follow I still follow Michael Sam on on Twitter and kept popping up that he's been retweeting a lot of Roclaw uh panthers tweets and it's a team in the uh european football league and i knew he was with the the with portugal for a little bit and they're the dragons he actually came out of retirement and played for the team in 2022 while he was a coach oh, i wow. thought that was really cool it was, yeah that's sick uh, that was, i think it was the same season that i talked to him just kind of a like catch up for the missourian and uh but he's on the team he's a defensive line coach hasn't played this season so strictly <laughs> staying on the defense and i remember this as well because there's a former mizzou defensive line coach Craig Kuligowski, who's also at Tulsa for a little bit. He was a part of the Pinkle era when he came over um, <laughs> to Mizzou. He was a defensive line coach. He recruited Michael Sam. Very cool that he's on his coaching staff. It probably is the reason he moved over to the Panthers. I just thought that was really fun. I, I feel like a lot of people, not a lot of people, a good amount of people might have known that already if you're still keeping tabs on Michael Sam. Um, but I remember writing about Coach Cool when he took the job with the Panthers. Overall, just cool that those connections are still there. Yeah, that rocks. That's a that's a that's a great connection. I didn't know that. So that's 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 sick. Warclaw too. That's a I think that's in Poland, right? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Go Panthers. I like I think more college not college. Uh NFL teams need to take that approach. Have a defensive line or offense whatever position coach that's re- ready just fresh out of the league and you keep them in shape and just keep a roster spot available if you throw them in. It's even funny when you go to his Wikipedia page and it's like a seven year gap in his professional playing career. <laughs> he just he had comes to come back. out of retirement. Yep. Love that. Uh That's yeah, funny. shout out, shout out Michael Sam. Hopefully the Panthers can get a can get to win. Uh hey Peyton, what's your tiger in the wild this week? Can he do uh, your Peyton impression? Um I don't like Connor Tolleson. Uh <laughs> kickers are the the bane of my existence. Uh my uh, Peyton's um, my- Tiger in the Wild. <laughs> Uh, is Harrison Mevis. Uh, this comes from, uh, I, I don't necessarily know, I don't know the coach of the Panthers or Canales is Dave Canales. His, his last, Dave Canales yeah. Uh, is that he wants to drag out the kicking competition as long as he can. So Eddie Pinheiro, former Bears kicker, also ties into Peyton's fandom, and Harrison Mevis can showcase their abilities. What a kicking battle, Eddie Pinheiro and, and Harrison Mevis. I don't want this to sound like a dig on Mevis. But if you're getting out in front and saying, I want the kicking competition to go as long as possible, that feels like to me that neither kicker has been very good. I don't know. Yeah, not to di- I don't want to dig Harrison Mevis in that sen- statement, but. It's a college saying. Yeah. Uh, you see a lot more in college and Harrison Mevis just finished graduating. Maybe. He, I don't know. He, he might have the upper hand there. Maybe he's a... ever in a kicking battle, though, in his college career. No, he maybe for kickoffs. Know. Yeah. I maybe it's a Brady Cook Sam Horn situation where he already knows Mevis is going to be the starter, but he's just doing this for drama. I don't know. He said Harrison Mevis second. Oh, you're right. We might have to sabotage Eddie Pinero. Put Adam Schefter out there and have him have Eddie Pinero hit him <laughs> with the ball. That, yeah, that, that that's how we learned is the key to getting your uh, getting you know your career ended as a kicker. Uh, nice, Peyton. Good good Tiger in the wild from you. Uh, I'm going back to the Olympics for my Tigers in the Wild. I I, I feel kind of cheating because I think we used uh, Carissa Schweitzer for a segment previously, but I'm 
Uh, using her again, she is, I believe, Missouri's only U.S. I didn't look at other countries. Only U.S. alum competing in the Olympics. Devin but, Booker. Oh, Devin Booker. oh, almost. That a hey, good tease for the Mount good Rushmore. Tease. Yeah, possible Mount Rushmore. Um, yeah, Chris Schweitzer. I, I'll just say we like so the Olympics obviously have started. So that she has her like schedule. She is running. Uh, I just thought people would would want to know if they want to watch. August 2nd, she's competing in the 5,000 meter race. It's at 11, 10 a.m. And then the 10,000 meter, which I believe is the one she's better at. I can't remember, but uh, that's at 1.55 p.m. on August 9th. So uh, everyone save those dates in your calendar. You can watch Christian Schweitzer uh, go for the gold in Paris. There you go. It's yeah. been a fun. Have you, have you been have you watching any Olympics, Kenny? Um, I watched the opening ceremony. Uh, Lay flag bearer looked yeah. majestic, <laughs> holding yep. a flag with, with Coco Goff. Um, I have my one of my Olympic shirts on right now um, from 1996, uh, four years before I was conceived. Uh, so there's, I wasn't didn't get to watch it, but I wish I wish I had that opportunity. Uh, but it's fun. Um, I like some of the sports that you know I know a little bit more about. I wish there was baseball. I mentioned that a couple of weeks ago, but yeah. basketball is good to me. Um, it, it's the Olympics are always good for people who probably don't watch sports much of the year, and they get to get involved in it as well. So it's it's good for everybody. I really love watching just the sports. I I you know you watch and you say like oh, I can maybe do that, and it's actually like. I'm a big advocate for the we should have a regular person compete in all the unusual sports to actually see how hard <laughs> it is. Regular person. <laughs> a, a lay person. Sorry, I don't know. Um, I also like uh, the, I saw a meme on Twitter that was like, a, you know, me when I watch like U.S. women's water polo and it's the uh, Adam Sandler from Uncut Gems where it just says, Let, let's bet on this. I want to bet on this. Just the gambling on on random sporting events and. That's that's a fun part of it too, but yeah, I, I love the Olympics. I like watching the just just people try to. I watched today. I watched. I think it was canoe slalom, and they're just in like rapids and have to like it's like ski slalom, but they're in a canoe. And I'm like, how do you even start to do this? Where, hmm. How what gets you interested in <laughs> in this activity? But it is it is pretty cool uh, to watch. But hopefully, Chris Schweitzer does well anyway. And uh, yeah, I'm glad you brought the LeBron flag bearer up. That was very funny. They look, they look great on that boat. We were going to win so many medals, the U.S. <laughs> it was the biggest boat. <laughs> it was it was the biggest boat. I think they have the most, like 490 or something like that. 590 maybe. Um, a lot of competitors. But yeah, Olympics is fun. Uh, headlines. Kenny, what's your headline? So we are recording on Sunday. It is 1 p.m. currently during Quick Hits. This could change. The tread deadline is on the 30th, so... When this episode comes out, trade deadline hasn't happened just yet. But Pete Fairbanks, his name has been kind of thrown around in some tweets recently, um, especially with the Yankees, the former Missouri pitcher who's now the the Rays closer. And we love Pete. We kind of talked about some of his funniest moments uh, that he has in press conferences. And get him in New York media, that oh stuff will be hilarious. And it will, it will run for a while. Uh, but Pete's name has been thrown around a little bit. The Rays are sellers right now, really unloading. It's a fire sale for Tampa. Uh, but Pete Fairbanks could be traded by the time you're listening to this. Could not be. Could still be a Ray by the 30th. Um, but this is a headline I've seen a couple times that there are serious talks from multiple reporters that Pete Fairbanks could be dealt in the next two days. Okay. We'll try and drag the show on for another hour, and then maybe he'll get traded while we're... Is the trade deadline today? It's the 30th. 30th. Oh, sorry. You might have said that. I, that, I, I might have, that part might have gone over my head. I apologize. Uh, 6 p.m. Yeah. Eastern. Okay. So maybe, yeah, maybe by the time you're listening to this, he's already a Yankee. Do you think he would go? Do the Yankees want your bait? You're a baseball knower. Give your analysis. Uh, they need a reliever. Uh, the Yankees are kind of, you know, not in the best spot right now. They've had a, a really good start to the season. Looked like one of the, the strongest Yankees teams in a while. Um, pitching and, and hitting has both fallen off, but Aaron Judge somehow continues just to be um, unhuman. He is literally the best player on the planet, and they think he'll just win MVP again. For a team that's really not matching his freak on offense. <laughs> yeah, the, didn't they go? I saw that something they went like like eight and twenty in a stretch or something crazy like they that. They went under I think I believe it's gonna be under five hundred um for July. Jeez. Tough stretch for New York. Yeah, not great. Not great for the Yanks. Well, maybe Pete Fairbanks can turn things around. There you go. Um good headline, Kenny. We'll see if he we'll see if he ends up being a Yankee. Uh Peyton's 
headline here of the week. I'll just read it. Uh, Memphis Athletics Chief Ref- Revenue Officer Brad Luce headed to Missouri. The, I, has this just become a bit now? Are we just <laughs> we just like to name the support staff that join uh, Laird Veach? Of course, uh, uh, he's still assembling his Missouri staff. Don't know who this guy is. I guess I could. What? What do I should I know who this is? Brad Luce. Rally for Ryan. Is that who? Is that who? Man? Yes. His daughter is Ryan. Really? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No. Yep. You're right. You're right. You're right. I'm, <laughs> I'm a bad fan. I'm a bad fan. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, there you go. That's that's a more fun connection than we've ever had for any of these support staff members. But like, again, I'll just say other than for Rally for Ryan, we probably never want to hear this guy's name mentioned because that means they're probably doing a good job. <laughs> I'd forgot about that. Did they mention that in the article? I don't know if they mention Rally for Ryan, but I mean, is is Brad's father Dave? Um, I think that I think the Memphis Tigers. I mean, there's connections to both schools. Yeah, yeah he was an assistant coach under um, Kim Anderson. Oh, there you go. So he's got some Mizzou ties. Well, there you go. That's Peyton's headline. Brad Luce. Uh, he's going to be so mad that you didn't know that. <laughs> He won't listen to the show. That's true. Peyton, if you listen to the show and you get to this point, text us the word canary and then we'll know you've listened. That's that's that's, good. that's how we'll know. Yeah, it's a good test. Um, he's going to be a senior associate AD for development at Mizzou. That will be his job. So congrats to Brad Luce. I hope you do a good job. And Rally for Ryan's a great cause. So it's already he was already only big, gone for he wasn't even gone for a full year. Couldn't you, you? You never can get out of Columbia. That's what they say. You, you always call. You always come crawling back every time. Uh, so congrats to Brad, and we'll see how Laird Veach does. Please schedule better games than at Miami of Ohio for football. That's all I ask. Uh, all right, my headline. I'm going away from sports for this one because this sent me down a rabbit hole on Saturday night. Um, we're we're gonna talk some movies, Kenny. You and I are, are both movie fans. I know you you especially are are a big Marvel guy. Um, there was there was news Marvel did. I think it. What was it, the San Diego Comic Con? I'm not. I'm not super well versed, so I'll just. I'll, I'll let you give your thoughts. Robert Downey Jr. is coming back to the Marvel universe. The headline reads: Marvel Robert Downey Jr. back as Doctor Doom for two Avengers movies. Doctor Doom's the one of the big supervillains. I think he's a. I was like, I went on a deep dive about who he was last night uh, after I saw this. But this feels like a pretty weird move. I was reading some some Twitter stuff about people who liked it, people who didn't. But you're a big Marvel guy. So I thought I'd let you uh, give your two cents. What do you think? RDJ, not Iron Man. He's a villain. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, you know, it's the first thing is like, you know, why is there an actor who played the the pivotal uh, character that opened up the Marvel franchise in the movies um, 16 years ago? Why is he playing someone else? We've seen this before. Um, Josh Brolin plays two different characters in the Marvel Universe. Uh, those two characters will never see each other. But at the same time, with, with Robert Downey Jr., it's like there are connections to the comics that Iron Man was Doctor Doom, and um, there, there's different variants out there now. It's just it's such a big universe, and it's hard to explain to the people that um, that don't watch it or haven't kept up with it. But there's a show called What If, and it's a big thing. Is like you know I'm nerding out here, but there's no you know, different different rabbit holes. What if uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s parents, or what if his yeah, parents didn't die in, in the car crash? You know, what if uh, Bucky didn't kill them? You know, what happens there? Does he become Doctor Doom in the end? Does he even become Iron Man? He probably doesn't become Iron Man. So there's always just those kind of things. And I mean, I'm really intrigued to see what happens um, with Doctor Doom um, in the show uh, Moon Knight, which came out a couple of years ago on Disney Plus. There was uh, some Doctor Doom references in the backgrounds of different parts of the show, and so it's nice that they're finally bringing him in back into the the Marvel world and into this Marvel universe. So I'm very excited to see where this kind of goes. Because if it's an Avengers movie, you're probably going to see Spider Man in it, and Spider Man's going to see Robert Downey Jr.'s face, and he's going to be like, "Up, oh, um, you're supposed to be dead." So there's going to be uh, there's going to be stuff like that. Probably going to be ties into different universes. I'm just excited for all of it. Uh, I haven't had a a show for the Avengers in a little, or not the Avengers, but for the Marvel in a little bit. Uh, there was an X-Men show recently, uh, but it need, needs something to get my fix. <laughs> Kenny is a big, a big Marvel guy as is Peyton. I, I like probably should have saved to bring this up when he was here. Maybe I'll get his, we'll get his thoughts on the next show when he comes back. But yeah, I don't, it feels so with all the multiverses and stuff like you can kind of just do anything. So yeah, sure. 
well, it's like, I guess let's see what happens. Uh, but there you go. That was, that's, that's your culture. Don't say we don't, don't say we don't talk about a uh, pop culture on the unwritten rule because we, we lock it down, especially when Kenny does the dozen quizzes instead of uh sporkle because he picks that as his quiz this week. Um, but yeah, there you go. Robert Downey Jr. is going to be a villain. Uh, on that note, Peyton, what's your joke of the week this week? I'm just kidding. I should have picked one jokes. for him. Wow. Click one. When did that come out? Why are we talking? <laughs> you got to enable, enable that ad blocker. <laughs> All right. We have a Halloween joke. Kenny's going to be posted one. July 15th. What is this about? Just so you bookmark it and come back for the people that aren't watching on the YouTube. How do vampires get to Transylvania? You're up. You got it. Scare plane. Uh, that was good. That was, that's a pretty good one, actually. What are you going to be for Halloween? Um, off the show. That's what I'll pretend to be. <laughs> He's Kenny's trick or treating. He's off the show. All right. That'll do it for the unwritten rule for another uh, show. We'll be back. We're getting close to fall camp. We're going to have a bunch of fall camp stuff. I'm excited for football to come back uh, and, and parade us with content or braid us. I don't know what word I'm looking for. Anyway, that'll do it for the unwritten rule for another uh, weekend. Hope you guys enjoyed. We'll see you back with Peyton and hopefully a fun Mount Rushmore for Friday. <laughs> <laughs>